Good morning. It's a pleasure to introduce Marina Fröhlich. She's a second year resident at our department and is finishing off her common trunk before she will return to the field of her interest, which is urology. But before that, she will give our morning round on a, on a topic you chose uh, on differentiated thyroid cancer. Enjoy. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Dr. Vettel already told, we will have a short overview today of differentiated thyroid cancer. And um, the incidence of thyroid cancer appears mostly between 25 and 65 years and is higher in female than in male population. It's three times higher in female population. Risk factors as genetic factors as a MEN2 syndrome or radiation exposure seems to be uh, risky for appearance of thyroid cancer. Thyroid cancer can be classified in different carcinomas. The differ uh, differentiated carcinomas uh, include papillary carcinoma and follicular carcinoma. Then we have undifferentiated carcinomas, anaplastic, and we have also medullary carcinomas. As you can see, papillary carcinoma are most frequent uh, thyroid cancers and have a really good five-year survival. Anaplastic carcinoma are um, really rare and they have a bad outcome after five years because of their really aggressive behavior. After this short overview, I will want to, to imagine that you have a patient in your outpatient clinic with a suspected thyroid nodule and um, maybe on a uh, detected on a physical examination or with incidentally noted on the on over imaging status. <coughs> what would you do the next? First of all, we will perform the anamnesis. There it's important to ask the patient about the radiation exposure, the positive family history, maybe there are signs for hyper or hyperthyroidism uh, or clinical signs as um, dysphagia or disorder of breathing or streeter or maybe hoarseness. Next, we will go on with laboratory examination. For this, we will check the um, thyroid hormones level and um, vitamin D and calcium to exclude the hyperparathyroidism. The calcitonin will be detected if we are deciding for, to go for a surgery in nodal, and antibodies should be checked if we have a patient with a hyperthyroidism. Scintigraphy. What kind of role does it play in the uh, workup level for thyroid nodules? Um, according to the guidelines, scintigraphy should be just performed in patients with a subnormal TSH uh, to detect if the nodule is non-functional or, or functional. And um, you should know that most endemic nodules are non-functional but just a small part of these non-functional nodules is ma malignant. So scintigraphy shows us just if the uh, nodule is function, not function, it does not give us the proof of malignancy. Therefore, we need other tools for detection. And with this could be, for example, sonography. Um, ultrasound should be performed in all patients with a suspected uh, thyroid nodule, and it answers this question about anatomy of thyroid gland and um, has also established some signs for malignancy. For example, hypoechogenicity, blurred and restricted margins, internodular vascularization, or microcalcification. It also shows us the status of cervical lymph nodes, which can be divided in um, subregions and summarized into central and lateral lymph nodes. So now, we have our findings in sonography. The sonography findings can give us the information of the level of malignancy suspicion. And what do we do the next? What do we do with a high suspicion finding in the sonography? Fine needle aspiration. Yes, that's true. That would be the next step in the diagnostic. Um, according to American Thyroid Association, we should perform fine needle aspiration in high suspicious or intermediate suspicious findings in ultrasound, which are bigger than one centimeter. Um, we should uh, perform also fine needle aspiration in tumors bigger than 
1.5 centimeters if they have low suspicions on ultrasound, and if they have low suspicions on ultrasound but are bigger than two centimeters. There is no recommendation for benign findings as cystic formations um, for a fine needle aspiration. So from this fine needle aspiration, we can get a cytopathology, which can uh, be subdivided into five groups, type 2, 1, 2, type 5, according to British Thyroid Association. And this helps us to decide how we are going on with our management of this disease. If you have a finding of cytopathology with the TI1, it's a non-diagnostic finding, and you should first of all repeat the fine needle aspiration. And as we could see uh, in studies that of this finding, there were 7% of patients have proved the malignancy, you should go for it uh, with a close follow-up by ultrasound or discuss an operation if there are changes in the follow-up. If we have the finding of TI2, it's a non-neoplastic finding of cytopathology. You should do just a follow-up. If we have TI3 in cytopathology, we can see their follicular lesions, but it's not clear what to do about this. I will tell you something more about this a bit later. And TI4 and 5, we got uh, a diagnosis of uh, malignant uh, changes in the cytopathology, and that's why we should go for operation. If we are going for surgery as a therapy, um, it is important that we have to ensure that this uh, surgery will be performed by our experienced surgeons to minimize the postoperative complications. And also, if we go for surgery, we should ask us some questions. Should we do a hemi or a total thyroidectomy? Should we do a lymphadectomy or do we need radio iodine therapy? So, if you have the type 3 diagnosis in cytopathology, um, it's not uh, specific if for an FNA to diagnose a follicular carcinoma because the diagnosis of follicular carcinoma requires a vascular or capsular invasion. And this we can just get from histopathology. So that's why here is surgery, diagnostic, and therapeutic point. But we can also decide, should we go for the first step with the total thyroidectomy, or maybe, first of all, a hemithyroidectomy where we have the nodal, and then to complete the surgery. This should be discussed on an interdisciplinary tumor board or with the patient. If we have follicular thyroid carcinoma, um, we have to go on with a total thyroidectomy, as I showed you before, because of vascular invasion, and in patients over 45 years. We should do not perform a prophylactic lymphadectomy if we do not have any suspicions for <coughs> lymph node metastasis, but we have to do one if we have oncocytic variant in the histology. Radiodine therapy is not uh, indicated in follicular carcinoma if we do not have a vascular invasion. So summarized, you see here, we perform maybe a hemithyroidectomy and detect a vascular invasion. Then we have to complete the surgery. And if we have in the histopathology also uh, oncocytic tumor cells, we should do a lymphadenectomy. If we have a papillary carcinoma in our cytopathology, which is smaller than one centimeter, we should perform a hemithyroidectomy and we do not need to complete this uh, after surgery. There is no evidence for lymphadenectomy if you don't have suspicions on sonography for the uh, lymph node metastasis and there is no radio uh, iodine therapy necessary. Exception is a multifollicular papillary carcinoma with more than five foci. If we have papillary thyroid carcinoma bigger than one centimeter, we should go on with a total thyroidectomy if the tumor is bigger than four centimeter, if there is extra thyroidal extension, if we have positive lymph nodes, and if we have just a smaller nodal, one to four centimeters, and we do not have extra thyroidal extension and no suspicions for lymph nodes, we can also discuss a hemithyroidectomy. 
but also in this case there are some reasons why we should perform a total pterodectomy um, and these are signs as prediction factors, risky factors as age over 45 years, central nodules and um, status after radioiodine therapy or positive family history. So now to the lymph node dissection. If we perform on papillary turret carcinoma, it's not um, indicated prophylactically, but it should be discussed or it should be performed if we have risk adapted. Uh, so in bigger carcinomas with invasion, T3, 4 uh, carcinomas should uh, receive a prophylactic uh, lymph node dissection um, in patients who are uh, older than 55 years or younger than 15 in male patients and if there are bilateral multifocal tumors. Um, in papillary thyroid carcinoma with suspected CN plus lymph node status, we should uh, perform a central lymphadenectomy in Europe. Uh, you should also perform an ipsilateral lateral lymphadenectomy and contralateral lymphadenectomy if there are more than five positive lymph nodes. In America, you do the lateral lymphadenectomy only if you have the histological confirmation of these positive lymph nodes. So after the surgery, you can complete uh, the TNM classification of your tumor findings for the staging, which can help us uh, to stratificate the risk and lead us through further management of the disease. But there is a part of this TNM classification, a neural classification, uh, according to American Thyroid Association, which divides um, a, the patient in three groups with a low, intermediate, <coughs> bless you, and uh, high risk uh, nodules. And um, there are summarizing some TNM classification um, values, factors, and they help us also to go on with the further managing of the disease. So low risk, you see, have no metastases, has all resected a tumor, no rest of the tumor, no invasion, no aggressive histology. And intermediate risk, you have microscopic invasion, but no uh, macroscopic invasion. You have just um, cervical lymph node metastases, no further lymph uh, metastases, no distant metastases. And in high-risk patients, you have macroscopic tumor invasions, you have uh, incomplete tumor resection, and distant metastasis. So depending on the risk gratification, we can decide should we do now the radio iodine therapy after surgery or not. And it is considered uh, that we should do a radio iodine therapy in patients who had received a total thyroidectomy uh, and are intermediate risk on intermediate risk level or um, according to TNM classification, all patients with PT1B or 2 with vascular invasion or histologically confirmed um, positive lymph nodes. And it's routinely uh, recommended after total pterodectomy in high-risk patients. So um, according to TNM classification, all patients with T3 or a higher stage. Mm. Now to the take-home messages. Um, TSH and sonography should be performed in every patient for the workup for suspected thyroid nodules. Scintigraphy is reserved just for patients with hyperthyroidism. FNA procedures uh, should be performed um, just in nodules bigger than one centimeter and depending on <gasps> findings of sonography. And surgery for cancer, you should perform a hemithyroidectomy if there is a microcarcinoma and tumors with a low risk features, smaller than two centimeters, otherwise you do a total thyroidectomy. And prophylactic uh, lymphadenectomy is reserved for patients with PT3 and 4 cancer. I'll thank you for your attention.
Uh, thank you very much for this nice overview. It's always nice to look again, even if we learn that many times at all these detailed prognoses. That are. Maybe I have a question. What's the regulation in Switzerland of the Board of Surgery? Do the people, how many thyroidectomy they need to to do in Switzerland to have that? Do you know also for us or for the ENT as a patient or referring doctors? I'm not sure where I should send the patient. So uh, as for now in Switzerland, there's no regulation, but there, sh there will be one coming, but we don't know the numbers that will be related. And we don't know if the numbers will be re related to the clinic or to the person. So, so far, there's none. There's a lot of going on towards putting patients into Eurocrine, which is a um, database to, to, to have a control for the... Um, for the quality to see basically also the follow-up on how many patients have, have complications. And then basically this should be a basis to then go back and, and, uh, and see if there's an issue. Um, we know that there's studies that show that sort of what is considered a low, too little is lower than 50 per year, basically, of these. Uh, but uh, there's been a work come out that came out last year that below 25, basically, there's a clear increase in risk of complications. But that's, of course, not for lymphadenectomies. That's just for... Um, Thyroid cancer, uh, what's the training? How are people trained? What's the minimal number of uh, thyroid surgery that need to be done to get the, the board of surgery in Switzerland? Um, for the board of, because it's general surgery, I think it's five, actually, for the general One surgery. Five. Only five, yes. And ENT, do you know if they have the same? Uh, I don't know. And, and the UMS, there is a UMS for, under, for endocrine surgery, right? The European board. What's the regulation here, do you know? The minimum amount, I'm not sure, because there's an exam and, and then there's a, you need a practical, you need to do surgery. So then the um, experts come and see you do surgery. But I'm not aware that there's a minimal number of surgeries that you have to have performed prior to the exam. So clearly there is an issue with five thyroidectomy and then you basically free to perform this procedure. Uh, there is here, that's a regulation in Switzerland. This is need, need some revision here. That's I guess. true, yeah. That's true. But my next question is about minimally invasive surgery yes. for thyroid. I mean, either laparoscopy or, or uh, robotic. I think there is big interest into that. Although it's a small incision, there's some advantages. I think, would you just comment on the, the this minimally invasive surgery for, for, for thyroid cancer? Absolutely. That's very interesting approach. So there's been the transaxillary minimal invasive, which is in Asia. That's where it's done the most. I mean, it's still, there's a quite a large access path. And now there's the newer one is the transoral, which is, I find very interesting because you can go transorally and then you, don't, you only have a scar on the inside of your lip, um, which is, seems to be promising. It started in Italy and in Germany. And um, the numbers are increasing. And I think that's a, a path to go for, at least in the beginning, for smaller uh, nodules, maybe not for cancer in the beginning until there's, um, there's enough expertise on that. But apparently the vision and everything is quite good, so I think that's uh, something to be invested. Yeah. Maybe I can. I just want to say that there's quite a lot have been changing. Um, so if you look at the old German guidelines, and they're not accurate anymore, and it's all the trend goes towards uh, doing less because the, we think that there's a quite a big overtreatment of this kind of cancer. And uh, there's a, in, the very important is the risk stratification because there are some patients that really need aggressive treatment and need radioiodine therapy. And these patients need to be completed and need to have also maybe a lymphadenectomy. But most of the patients are really very low risk and will um, be overtreated with, uh, with a total thyroidectomy and a lymphadenectomy. And uh, that's the trend to do less. Yeah, I would have a question. I, I can understand the over-treatment because if, if you look at your Thai classification, in 97% of the cases you can just do surgery based on what she was showing. So only in the T, TH, uh, Thai 1 or 2, you don't do anything. That's only a 3% of the cases. That's true, but then there's, there's only a, a small percentage of people that will have that. Most of the people have Thai 2. And the people that get punctured should already have some so sort of sonographic um, high risk or so sonographic risk features. So if you um, or need to have a bigger nodule. So it's not uh, the most people won't get won't get an FNA at all. And those that get one, most of them have a type two. So and if, especially in Switzerland, we have very good patholo cytopathologists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.